as a child, I couldn't keep still. I had loads of energy. Couldn't even keep still for a cartoon. I started dancing, and within weeks, I knew this is what I wanted to do. This is where I belonged, and I found Amy. But when I was 11 years old, um, it was Christmas Eve. My parents were taking us to Winter Wonderland ice skating. Now, normally, something that I would be like asking every five seconds, when are we going? When are we going? How much longer now? But that day I was really pale, I had no energy. Um, but I insisted on going, I wasn't a child that was ever going to miss out. Um, and I got on a car and a stomach pain started. Um, and my parents thought, oh, this isn't Amy at all. And just thought, oh, it's probably the Christmas excitement has wiped her out. Uh, we got to the Winter Wonderland and we were walking around and I, yeah, I just started keeling over. And then the next thing I passed out from the pain. They took me to hospital and um, they thought it was appendicitis and then they ruled that out. I spent the whole Christmas recovering, but I was pretty much bed bound, pain, vomiting, and the doctors put it down to a virus, didn't really know. And then that January just started to lose a lot of weight, a lot of other symptoms come, such as mouth ulcers, joint aches. And this Amy who couldn't keep still, you know, it was hard to get me to even get off the sofa. Um, and doctors were putting it down to maybe IBS, maybe a virus, growing pains, hormones. Nobody wanted to do tests. It was completely out of the blue. A lot of them were asking, was I eating? Which was frustrating because I actually loved my food. I was a person like, Rebecca, my twin sister, have you finished? Because I was ready to eat it. And my brother, Lloyd. There was certainly not an eating problem, but doctors were starting to think, oh, and you know, now she's in secondary school. You know, she's a dancer. Is she worried about her weight? Just because I was so small. And this was never the case. And for me, that was really frustrated because I was like, are you not listening to me? I'm not doing this to myself. I want to be like my friends in school. I want to be dancing. I'm not here stuck in pain. But this was the start, basically, of Crohn's disease. We always knew it was Crohn's disease, I think, because I have two cousins with Crohn's on both sides of the family. Helen, who um, was the first person in South Wales to be diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and unfortunately no longer with us. And then on my other side of the family, Rachel, another first cousin, um, and she lives now with a stoma. And growing up, I used to watch Rachel in so much pain, and I always used to promise myself I wouldn't get like Rachel. And obviously, my auntie would ring my mum and say, look at Amy, it's identical. And I used to tell my mum to push. I think, obviously, my parents did lots of research. I'd be in IT lessons, Googling it, you know, all my symptoms. I think we always knew it was Crohn's, but doctors, they just didn't want to go there. They didn't want to investigate. And I understand now because a lot of the tests there were quite invasive to put a child through. But these, we called them flare-ups or attacks, where the pain would just come with a vengeance. Would come for a couple of weeks and then go for a couple of weeks. And, you know, those couple of weeks we'd be counting down the days. You're like, oh my goodness, I've been 10 days now without being poorly, 11, 12, and then it'd be back again. My parents would do a food diary. They worked extra hours to try and get me a private appointment. Um, but we'd just go around in circles and then when I was 18, it came with a vengeance. I was sitting my A-level exams, now knowing more about Crohn's, probably the stress of my A-levels is what brought on um, this really bad flare. I remember being in my A-level um, A level English exam, and I was just sweating in so much pain, needing to go back and forth to the toilet, being really embarrassed every time I had to stand out the exam, but also thinking, I need to be writing, not back and forth to the toilet. And when the exam was finished, or the relief, but also the panic of, have well, I even passed this? Um, and I was passing a lot of black stools. And then from that few days of really bad diarrhea, i become chronically constipated. So, and I just couldn't open my bowels. The most common symptom of Crohn's disease is diarrhea. So it put doctors even further away. They were really not questioning Crohn's then, but then we were like, but all the other symptoms. And actually there is a percentage of people who suffer with the constipation side. And I just couldn't open my bowels. I was in and out of hospital, needing enemas. This is my 18th year, you know. All my friends are off to uni. My twin sister, I'd worked so hard on my A-levels. I come away with, with three A's and a C. My life should have just been beginning and then all of a sudden 
everything comes crashing down. I'd got myself a scholarship in London for dance, which I was then refused entry because I couldn't pass the medical because I had an unknown condition. I was seen as a risk. And this was so frustrating. I used to think, what have I done to deserve this? I was a good student, a teacher's pet, you know, prefect in school, worked really hard in my dancing. And I used to think, why me? And I was watching my twin sister, you know, living life to the full. And I used to get so frustrated. And it annoyed me that I had so many opportunities, job opportunities, dancing opportunities, also robbed. And I was thinking, well, it doesn't take away my talents or my hard work, my dedication. I'd do anything in the world not to suffer with this. And I was thinking, you know, that is in itself discrimination because you're seen as a risk. And we just didn't have this diagnosis. And it was, oh, it was so annoying. And I think that was making me even more ill because the stress of that was playing a part. And I'm an August baby. So to my A-levels, turned 18. And then you go into an all of a sudden, an adult ward when you're in hospital. And that is huge. You only get two visiting hours a day. Um, all of a sudden, you know, you're on a ward with 60-year-olds, 70, and, you know, you're just, in effect, still a kid. And I wanted my mum there when the doctors were coming round or to be able to tell her my symptoms because I was too tired and in too much pain. So I think that was a massive impact as well on what was causing me to become even more ill. But then when I was um, 19, so from 18 to 19, a, year, um, a month didn't go by where I didn't spend at least a week in hospital. And we were just going around in circles and they were, they were just saying, oh, we'll get you on pain relief, anti-sickness. And we were like, this is no way to live. And I remember when I was 19, I'd gone to just under seven stone and I was so poorly in hospital. Um, and the drip had come out of my vein and caused an infection in my arms. So that made me even worse. I was in so much pain. I was on the ward the one night. And I'd had all the morphine I could. I couldn't even lift my head up to be sick. It was just all over me. And I can remember thinking, I can't live like this. Like, we're not getting answers. They're talking about just getting me on pain relief and anti-sickness. That's not a way to live. You know, and I think I was really low. It was Christmas time. My, you know, seeing on Facebook all my friends having their student Christmas parties. And I'm just looking at four walls in a hospital. I just rang my parents and said, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And I think everyone else was looking saying, that's no way to live. My parents were down the hospital. It was 3.30 in the morning. And um, and I, I think the team around me, the nurses, could just see how poorly I was. And then the decision was that I was going to be transferred to um, London Hospital. I think my parents had just also had enough. And there wasn't an investigation form for me. So they transferred me to London, where I spent six weeks in total in hospital. And just getting to London and speaking to my doctor, he didn't open my notes. He just looked and went, I think you've got Crohn's disease. And we were like, we've been saying this for years. We knew the whole time. I've watched my cousins grow up with it. You know, we knew the symptoms. I'd been on wards with many other patients and just speaking to them, it was just alike. And even the way we described the pain. And then I had MRI, I had colonoscopy, endoscopy, CT scan. And then I was told, yeah, I had Crohn's disease, my terminal ileum and a small bowel. And it was just a sense of relief. I can remember my parents' faces, just finally we had answers. And I think I was deluded in the sense I thought, right, get me on the meds, off I go. It did take a couple of years then to obviously find the medication that worked for me. I did think I was never going to have a Crohn's flare up again. That's not the case, right, I've learned. But what I can say is I'm far better than I was then, thank goodness. But yeah, and I've learned how to live with my condition. I've learned what medication keeps me in remission for the longest, what to do when I do have a flare up. But it was a long, painful eight years of diagnosis. Um, and I think it's because not enough research is done into Crohn's disease. I think um, some of the symptoms, if you don't have diarrhea, you don't take that box. So they, you know, they don't even consider you. And obviously there is that confusion with IBS. You know, I was in that age as well, you know, where you're growing up, your hormones, your body changes. Um, but I think the most frustrating thing was is that for me and my family, we always knew it was Crohn's. And watching my cousins have to battle as well with diagnosis. Um, I think it's better now, but I still think a lot of people are going through a long diagnosis period and it shouldn't be the case. Mm -hmm.